Hello everyone. Thank you for joining me today. Uh, my name is Nishan Subedi. I'm the VP for uh, Algorithms and AI at Overstock.com. And today I want to talk to you about data ecosystem to power AI. Um, so sure, a lot of you have uh, different uh, AI systems uh, models that you've built and are eager to release in production and kind of live in the value stream of your organization. Uh, and they have to kind of in this ecosystem work with a number of other systems that have been built and other systems that production uh, that support uh, the functions that your organization does. Um, in, in, in this talk, I want to talk to you about uh, this ecosystem and how we might design these systems in a way uh, that helps empower AI to realize the most uh, efficient uh, value in your organization. Um, Quickly, before we go into the topic, uh, I wanted to introduce Overstock. Uh, Overstock is a retail company. Uh, we're an e-commerce website with uh, over uh, over 59 million monthly visits. Uh, we, we have a growing machine learning function and continue to rely on it more for uh, our business operations. Uh, and, and, and we manage uh, uh, multiple sellers with with an assortment of over 8 million products. Um, with that, uh, first I want to introduce uh, three different patterns um, uh, that are fairly widely used uh, in the industry currently. And the first one of those uh, comes, from, uh, comes from the practice of software engineering. Uh, this is software-oriented architecture and, and even kind of more granularly uh, microservices. So uh, uh, for those of you that are not familiar, the microservice pattern breaks down each kind of uh, uh, application into smaller granular blocks uh, and these services end up calling each other. So as uh, for this example, uh, service A calls out to C, which calls out to D, uh, service B also calls out to D and E. Uh, so for an e-commerce business, for example, this can be uh, the front end for the user uh, calling out to the backend uh, REST service or an API gateway that may call out to the recommendations engine. It might call out to uh, building particular widgets. It may call out to get content information and, and, and inventory and various different things of that sort. So the uh, advantages of this uh, architecture and the, and the reason why it's so prevalent uh, in the industry right now is that applications uh, manage their own state. Uh, and, and, and so this makes it very easy for us to add more services. So if you want to add a new functionality, for example, for H to call out to E, um, you don't need to necessarily work with a whole lot of different consumers. It's, it's fairly easy and trivial to kind of add additional services. Um, but, but it comes with its own set of problems. There's no natural consistency or, uh, in the data handling mechanism. Each of these services, because they have the flexibility to build the system they want to, uh, also kind of come with the cost of uh, differences in implementation uh, in, in data handling mechanisms. Uh, they're also very difficult to control for semantic segmentation. Uh, what do I mean by that? So normally uh, what we observe from these systems are uh, the artifacts that they produce. And so for a REST API, for example, uh, the, the request and the response ends up being mostly the semantics that are exposed from these systems. But in the process of kind of adding more uh, capabilities and stuff and as we break these uh, different services what we end up doing is fragmenting the 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 semantic information that uh, these APIs present to us uh, so it makes uh, being able to uh, observe and learn from these systems very very difficult um, it, it gives us not a standard definition of the data essentially uh, the other fairly common practice is uh, three normalized form databases for BI purposes. Um, so if we look at the common case, uh, the continued example of e-commerce, uh, the shopping cart, for example, would be uh, one of the normalized table. Uh, it would have a user ID associated with it. There'd be an order with a order ID, user ID associated with it. And so there are these various relationships that are managed. This form of data is really good uh, when you want to prevent duplication of information. Um, and kind of 
as these uh, service architectures have become so prolific in organizations, what we uh, typically end up seeing is uh, the, the databases uh, that these, uh, these service uh, microservices contain, they end up being replicated in some shape or form uh, for use for reporting purposes and for BI. So what this does is uh, we, we create a brittle replication of the microservices and this actually violates kind of the, the uh, initial principle that we start microservices off with, which is they manage and contain their state in their entirety. Um, so that kind of state is now leaky. So this, uh, this makes our reporting very tightly coupled with uh, our application itself and ultimately kind of creates more more uh, checkpoints and, and more friction in terms of being able to make this. Um, the third pattern I want to talk about is uh, a standard that is quickly kind of developing in machine learning where uh, the feature store represents the different data transformations uh, that, that uh, we want to uh, uh, go through in uh, building our uh, machine learning systems for feature engineering specifically. And so uh, the, the feature store ends up capturing these kind of aggregated features, which, uh, which can be called out for both model serving and training. Uh, and for specifically for the uh, serving part, the, the feature store is accessible either in batch or real time form to be called out by services. Uh, so in this example, uh, we call out the get feature vector uh, uh, by passing in the specific kinds of features, which is the click IDs, the price, uh, and then uh, get back uh, the features which we pass into our specific models to get inference. And this gets used in various different forms uh, for recommendations engines, uh, for search applications, or, or any kind of any area you want to productionize a machine learning system. Uh, and you want these ser services to be uh, available online uh, for natural inference, you would uh, typically set up some kind of serving API for them. Uh, and in the batch use case, you would kind of run through the featureization and the prediction step and maybe publish the, the outputs of these systems. Um, so these systems look quite uh, uh, disparate from one another. And so, uh, uh, you know, because these are three really important tasks in, in the operation of an organization, um, how can we kind of uh, tie these different kinds of patterns together, right? And so uh, the next couple of slides will will talk about how we go about effectively merging these three uh, patterns, and and we'll kind of uh, ask for some specific design decisions, which which uh, uh, I think will uh, vastly simplify these uh, these systems and allow them to kind of work with one another. So. The first one of them uh, allows us to push accountability to the source systems themselves. So these are the applications, the microservices. Um, and, and the way we do that, well, the, the way we uh, 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 yeah, do this is to publish any inner state of the system that is uh, useful for downstream application as events and without breaking consistency. So. Uh, any event that is published should always be backwards compatible and the semantic definition of these events should not change. So uh, you can have uh, you can have additions to the, the functionality that these services produce. Uh, you can have changes to them and so but those would constitute either uh, maybe a different make of creating these uh, stateful events or the addition of events in the system but never the changing of the semantic definition. Um, <clears throat> and, and what we get from this is that the data, which is, which is the event, which contains the state uh, information, uh, is correct uh, and, and, and is baked into the request part of every release. So uh, that should have been baked. And so uh, essentially uh, by developing a feature, by having a particular API, like you get the correct form data for free, which is really useful. Uh, we also get accountability of the data published by the source systems for free, which is um, because these uh, events are what you rely on to, uh, to act upon the information. So uh, for example, if a user puts an item to the cart, right? So you might have a 
cart added event which says what the user id is what the what the uh, cart id is or the product id is uh, and so so by downstream applications relying on this event uh, for their decisioning uh, you also get the same consistent data for free and and so uh, so then uh, the second part of the merging of these patterns is to uh, handle all downstream activities as consumption and processing of these events so these events are these consistent things the systems are producing and there's different kind of uh, uh, reactions to these systems happening further downstream that the source systems are not aware of so this allows for uh, raw curation for uh, machine learning features uh, so we can just kind of process these different uh, events in various ways. It allows for curated data for exploration and analytics and also a standard stable definition for reporting, which is based off of this, this semantic definition of the events themselves. So then uh, when we go into uh, the architecture specifically, uh, what are the differences, right, in terms of how we used to architect these systems in the past? Uh, the first one is applications do not need to expose their internal databases for reporting needs either, because what they're exposing are these events, uh, which uh, trigger downstream kind of processing, uh, as well as kind of get collected for any uh, BI and, 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 and machine learning tasks. The next part is these data warehouses are uh, built on this explicitly logged data by applications and also featureization uses the same data sources for uh, reporting uh, that reporting and warehousing uses uh, and these characteristics are, are uh, contained in in the reactive principles of building microservices um, they come with a set of principles i'll highlight the few that are pertinent to kind of the specific problem at hand so the first is autonomy and uh, the way uh, the, the reactive uh, method of building microservices calls out for it is uh, for applications to publish behavior through a standard schema. Uh, this could be the uh, CQRS format where there's a command or a query, uh, there's the event-driven mechanism, but you know, for our uh, use case, uh, as long as it's a standard schema that publishes all of the stateful information, uh, it's sufficient for our needs. Uh, it is event driven, which is uh, uh, the services produce, consume and react to events. Um, not going to go into the specifics of how and there's various different patterns, but, but as long as it's event driven, it satisfies our constraints. And uh, for these events, the, the requirements are that they're reusable in multiple contexts. So if we have the same standard definition, so a cartad is a cartad is a cartad. Uh, different uh, sources, uh, different downstream applications may want to use different parts of the information, but the ask here is uh, to publish all of the state uh, that is useful for these different contexts uh, as one consistent event. Uh, they should include enough information to describe the, the state and to describe the change to the state that is happening and the schemas themselves uh, should be backwards compatible. And lastly, uh, ownership of the state uh, within the, or, uh, within the uh, application. So uh, these systems should uh, own their states exclusively uh, by managing and persisting their own state. So these internal databases are strictly for internal use, uh, which allows the flexibility uh, and any downstream processing uh, happens through these events that get published from the source systems. Uh, so then, okay, uh, we talked about how these uh, architectures and systems would evolve, uh, and, and this brings us very close to uh, uh, event-driven architecture, which is very closely interrelated with uh, domain-driven design. And the idea behind domain-driven design is to try to define your domain, the domain of your organization, and structure it in a way uh, where uh, these entities uh, you create for your domain, describe uh, the things uh, that are happening in your organization. So uh, one, one additional nuance to this is uh, uh, the form of domain-driven de design, which is event first. So um, again, not going to go into a whole lot of detail around this. There's various different schools of thought, but the event first uh, approach, uh, what it ultimately says is 
uh, instead of trying a top-down approach in terms of trying to define your domain, um, first defining the events that are used uh, and event storming is, is kind of what it refers to, uh, allows you the ability to better define your domains. Uh, again, we, for our intents and purposes, we don't necessarily need to kind of uh, go into what would be the most effective way there, but as long as we are defining our, our domains uh, via these events, uh, they give us some key, uh, 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 key, key utility that ends up being really useful. So uh, these events produce a record of what happens to each entity uh, and when it happens. They represent facts about the domain and our sources of truth. So uh, all truth about kind of what's happening in our systems come from these events and they tell us exactly what happened and when they happened. So uh, again, if we continue with our example of e-commerce, uh, what these uh, this event-driven approach may look like is uh, we produce events for different kinds of things that happen. So for example, the website or the app or the point of sale system might produce different kinds of events such as a new order is placed or a question is asked or a return uh, processing is requested and these then flow through the uh, event router to the various systems that uh, subscribe to or are, are, are kind of asked to process this request and that event the the exact event and the information there is what is specific to the domain and would be captured as, as part of this design so then uh, if we define our systems this way we can start looking at reporting featureization for ml alerting as outputs of this event processing uh, which allows us uh, reusability of the data so uh, first we have access to raw data and we can kind of process it in in any kind of way we uh, desire uh, but also kind of we get to reuse uh, the same data processing for various different use cases so uh, the same data can end up in our data warehouses as uh, domain specific models uh, that get featureized and represented uh, for machine learning purposes. So the higher order tasks uh, require less total effort to get the models in production and uh, any kind of validation uh, is, is getting leveraged across the entire organization. So uh, one, one common uh, uh, nuance and difference that we, well, one common uh, access that, a lot, that creates a lot of distinction in our systems is uh, batch driven versus real time systems and the distinctions made on them. Um, the data flow uh, uh, model of, of representing data uh, uh, allows us to represent our data processing without uh, the need for a distinction between batch and real time. So whether data is coming from batch or stream, uh, there's a consistent set of APIs uh, in the Apache Prem framework uh, that allows us to uh, process them downstream without needing to make this distinction of handling uh, batch and real-time explicitly. And so what this allows us to do is again uh, uh, the distinctions between what is batch and what is real-time uh, it allows us to bring it down to the tolerance and limitations of what we want in our solutions. Uh, so for example uh, if we want to know the number of sessions uh, uh, in our uh, uh, of, of let's say user sessions uh, coming to our website so uh, the trade-off between batch and real time can be the trade-off between what you need for your quarterly reporting for example versus what you want to do to be able to react to uh, immediate discrepancies so you might be a lot more tolerant of uh, 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 incorrect bot filtering when you want this information as soon as possible for some alerting purposes, then what you would want to report uh, on a quarterly basis to your stakeholders. Um, and so these trade-offs can be managed independent of the architecture. So this allows us to have one architecture, again, one consolidated stream uh, that's used uh, while still being able to uh, 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 account for the different kinds of needs. So to summarize all of kind of what we talked about, right? Uh, like following these key design patterns allows us these particular outcomes. Uh, we get a standard domain model that's used consistently across the organization. And 
And this can be quite powerful if, if, if done uh, effectively. So uh, you get your uh, developers, uh, software developers, using the same domain model as your uh, BI folks, as your uh, analysts, as your machine learning scientists, as well as you know your uh, your business stakeholders, right? These domains really become the language uh, across your entire organization. Uh, this allows for better better accountability structure for the data as well. Uh, uh, the data, because all these systems rely on the correctness of the data, you you get accountability all the way from the source uh, down to every uh, single processing task that happens on the data. This also allows data quality efforts to have much wider impact because everything is coined on these uh, uh, these structured uh, domain event definitions. Uh, uh, investigations in one place can easily translate to uh, effectiveness in other areas. Um, also, the insights from these uh, reports are directly translatable to ML models. Uh, the applications preserve state and they aren't tightly coupled with one another and the system as a whole is more robust. Uh, not only do your applications not have to rely on every other application that it needs to call out to, uh, your data becomes more robust, your reporting is more robust, and your models for machine learning become more robust as well. So the systems as, as a whole uh, tend to become much better uh, by using kind of these practices. So end of my uh, talk, thank you so much again. Uh, my name is Nishan Subedi. Um, I work at Overstock and we're hiring. Please reach out if you're interested. Thank you.